Hello friends, I am Dr. Eram Khan from CIIT NCERT. Today we will start the topic of sexual reproduction in flowering plants under the unit reproduction. We have divided this chapter in four parts. In the first part, we will discuss about flower as a reproductive structure of angiosperms, the male and female parts of the flower the structure and development of microsporangia and the pollen grain. The second part will cover the structure and development of the megasporangium or the ovule and the embryo sac along with its types. The third part will give the detailed account of pollination, its kinds, pollen pistil interaction and artificial hybridization. The fourth part will comprise of double fertilization and post fertilization structures and events like endosperm and embryo development, formation of seeds in the fruits, parthenocarpic fruits and the process of apomixis and polyembryony. So first we will discuss about flower which is a fascinating organ of sexual reproduction in angiosperms. The process of producing new individuals by the fusion of male and female gametes is called sexual reproduction. It is supposed to be an advanced stage in the life history of a plant. Gametes are the sex cells which are formed within a flower. The myriads of flowers that we enjoy gazing at, the scents and the perfumes that we swoon over, the rich colors that attract us are all there as an aid to sexual reproduction. All flowering plants show sexual reproduction. A look at the diversity of structures of the inflorescences, flowers and the floral parts show an amazing range of adaptations to ensure formation of the end products of sexual reproduction, the fruits and the seeds. Human beings have got an intimate relationship with flowers since time immortal. Flowers are objects of aesthetic, ornamental, social, religious and cultural values. They have always been used as symbols for conveying important human feelings such as love, affection, happiness, grief, etc. I would like to mention here floriculture or flower farming. It is a discipline of horticulture concerned with the cultivation of flowering and ornamental plants for gardens and for floristry comprising the floral industry. The development via plant breeding of new varieties is a major occupation of floriculturists. Biologically flowers are morphological and embryological marvels and the sites of sexual reproduction. Let us see the parts of a typical flower. The petals and sepals are the vegetative parts of a flower while the two parts in a flower in which the two most important units of sexual reproduction develop are the androsium and the gynosium. The androsium consists of a whirl of stamens consisting the male reproductive organ and the gynosium consists of pistil which represents the female reproductive organ. In this diagram you can see the longitudinal section of a flower. Now we will discuss the male reproductive structure of a flower. Generally the androsium is the third inner whorl of a flower. It is composed of stamens. Each stamen consists of a long and slender stalk called filament and the terminal generally bilobed structure is called the anther. Male gametes are produced in the pollen grains. The pollen grains develop in the anthers of the flower. The two lobes of the anther are connected with each other by a sterile tissue called the connective. Each anther has four microsporangia which contain the pollen grains or microspores. The stamens of a flower may be free or united. Now let us see the female reproductive structure of a flower. The gynosium or the pistil is the innermost whorl of a flower. It is the female reproductive part of the flower. The gynosium is composed of carpels. Each carpel has three parts. They are ovary, style and stigma. The basal swollen part of the carpel is called the ovary. The long or short middle portion is the style and the terminal receptive structure is the stigma. The stigma serves as a landing platform for the pollen grains. The ovary bears ovules inside it. 
In this diagram, you can see the structure of a pistil. Female gametes are produced in the ovule. The ovule develops in the ovary of the flower. Now, let us see the development of male gametophyte. The pollen grains or microspores are produced within the anther of the stamen. A typical angiosperm anther is bilobed with each lobe having two theca. That is why they are called dithecus. The development of pollen grain or microspore in the microsporangium of an anther is called microsporogenesis. A typical anther consists of four microsporangia. Let us understand the various types of tissues and their organization in the transverse section of an anther. In this diagram, we can see the transverse section of a young anther, an enlarged view of one microsporangium showing ball layers. The bilobed nature of an anther is very distinct in the transverse section of the anther. The anther is a four-sided or tetragonal structure consisting of four microsporangia located at the corners, two microsporangia in each lobe. Here, I would like to mention that the microsporangia develop further and become pollen sacs. They extend longitudinally all through the length of an anther and are packed with pollen grains. In a transverse section of the structure of microsporangium, we can observe that a typical microsporangium appears near circular in outline. It is generally surrounded by four wall layers, the epidermis, endothesium, middle layers and the tapetum. The outer three wall layers perform the function of protection and help in dehiscence of anther to release the pollen. The innermost wall layer is the tapetum. It nourishes the developing pollen grains. Cells of the tapetum possess dense cytoplasm and generally have more than one nucleus. When the anther is young, a group of compactly arranged homogeneous cells called the sporogenous tissue occupies the center of each microsporangium. Now, let us understand the process of microsporogenesis. As the anther develops, the cells of the sporogenous tissue undergo meiotic divisions to form microspore tetrads. Each cell of the sporogenous tissue is capable of giving rise to a microspore tetrad. Each one is a potential pollen or microspore mother cell. The process of formation of microspores from a pollen mother cell through meiosis is called microsporogenesis. The sporogenous cells divide and give rise to the microspore mother cells. Microspore mother cells contain two sets of chromosomes and are therefore diploid, that is 2n in number. After formation, the microspores are arranged in a cluster of four cells called the microspore tetrad. As the anther mature and dehydrate, the microspores dissociate from each other and develop into pollen grains. Inside each microsporangium, several thousands of microspores or pollen grains are formed that are released with the dehiscence of anther. Here in this diagram, you can see a matured dehisced anther. You can observe mature pollen grains coming out of the openings of the mature dehisced anther. Now, let us discuss pollen grains. The pollen grains or microspores represent the male gametophytes. If you touch the open anthers of hibiscus or any other flower, you would find deposition of yellowish powdery pollen grains on your fingers. You can observe them by the help of a microscope. Pollen grains are found in a variety of architecture, sizes, shapes, colors, designs. It can be seen on the pollen grains from different species. Pollen grains are generally spherical, measuring about 25 to 50 micrometers in diameter. It has a prominent two-layered wall. The hard outer layer, called the exine, is made up of sporopollenin, which is one of the most resistant organic material known on earth. It can withstand high temperatures and strong acids and alkali. No enzyme that degrades poropollenin is so far known to us. At certain places, the exine is absent or very thin, giving an appearance of a pore 
called the germ pore. Generally, there are three germ pores in dicots and one germ pore in monocots. The inner wall of the pollen grain is called the intine. It is a thin and continuous layer made up of cellulose and pectin. The cytoplasm or pollen grain is surrounded by a plasma membrane. When the pollen grain is mature, it contains two cells, the vegetative cell and the generative cell. Here we can see a mature pollen grain containing vegetative cell and generative cells. The vegetative cell is bigger, has abundant food reserve and a large irregularly shaped nucleus. The generative cell is small and floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell. It is spindle shaped with dense cytoplasm and a nucleus. In over 60% of angiosperms, pollen grains are shed at two cell stage. In the remaining species, the generative cell divides mitotically to give rise to the two male gametes before pollen grains are shed, that is in the three cell stage. While the process of fertilization, which we will discuss in detail later on, when the pollen grains reaches the stigma, the intine grows out through a germ pore into a slender pollen tube. The generative cell divides into two male gametes. The process of development of male gametophyte from a pollen grain is called microgametogenesis. Life of the male gametophyte is very short as compared to that of the sporophyte. Friends, it is important to know that pollen grains of many species cause severe allergies and bronchial afflictions in some people, often leading to chronic respiratory disorders like asthma, bronchitis, etc. On the other hand, pollen grains are rich in nutrients. It has become a fashion in recent years to use pollen tablets as food supplements. In Western countries, a large number of pollen products in the form of tablets and syrups are available in the market. Pollen consumption has been claimed to increase the performance of athletes and race horses. The study of pollen grains is called palynology. Here we can see some of the pollen products in this diagram. After shedding, the pollen grains have to land on the stigma before they lose viability. If they have to bring about fertilization, how long do you think the pollen grains retain viability? The period for which pollen grains remain viable is highly variable and to some extent depends on the prevailing temperature and humidity. In some cereals such as rice and wheat, pollen grains lose viability within 30 minutes of their release. And in some members of Rosaceae, Leguminaceae and Solanaceae, they maintain viability for months. Friends, you may have heard of storing semen or sperms of many animals including humans for artificial insemination. It is possible to store pollen grains of a large number of species for years in liquid nitrogen on minus 196 degree centigrade. Such stored pollen can be used as pollen banks similar to seed banks in crop breeding programs. So friends, now I have come to the end of the first part of this lesson on sexual reproduction of flowering plants. Today we have discussed the flower, its role as an organ of sexual reproduction in flowering plants. We have seen the reproductive parts of a flower, the stamen and the pistil. We have also covered the structure and development of microsporangia and the pollen grains along with their importance. In the next episode, we will focus on the female reproductive structures and will cover the structure and development of megasporangia or the ovule and the embryo sac. Here I will leave you some points for thinking. Why the exine of the pollen grain is too hard? What is cryopreservation? Why do we use this procedure? We will discuss these points in the next lecture. With this, I conclude this episode. Thank you. Thank you.